We first, I first met her in a, in a, a chance encounter uh, on the Thames path uh, a few years ago, and um, we made eye contact. <laughs> I was on, uh, my first impression was of a very attractive woman out jogging on a spring morning. Um, her first impression was of a potential child molester. <laughs> and, um, that part of the Thames path just happens to run behind my children's school, and she'd stumbled on one of my great, life's greatest pleasures, which is was to stop on my morning bike ride and just watch my children playing in the playground unnoticed. And um, this clearly didn't impress Melora at all. Um, I think I had some probably rather un prepossessing facial hair, um, cycling headgear. I mean, it wasn't the best look um, uh, to be hanging outside school playgrounds, and I had a problem with people. Um, and Melora's children also attended the same school, so I'd, you know, I'd inadvertently stumbled on a lioness guarding her cubs. <laughs> and it was in the process of dissuading her from reporting me to the authorities that we became good friends. <laughs> And uh, since then, I've never really been in any doubt as to where she places children's well-being on her list of priorities. Um, this Barber project isn't something she's a pain in the neck about. Uh, she, I mean, she has been with me in the last couple of days. <laughs> you needn't fear her for that. Um, she doesn't bore you on the school runs or the dinner parties. And um, she actually brings a delightful vigor and energy to what she does. Uh, she very rarely stoops to any cheap manoeuvres like getting actors in to espouse uh, <laughs> causes, but um, it's a momentary lapse and I'll, I'll be gone in a minute. Um, but she, she handles this with extraordinary dignity and um, she st shares her story with, with those who are willing to listen. Um, I think she really is a lioness. So we're not here tonight trying to change the world, I just want to change the world for 20 children who are right now wasting away in Bulgaria's social care system. They survive under really grim conditions, and their existence is monotony. It's horrible, horrible monotony, 24 hours a day. Um, the worst part is that they live without affection, without stimulation, and without love. They have nobody who loves them, really nobody who even knows their name. And I think that's a disgrace. Um, it's difficult. Let, we've got a photo somewhere. Who's click, clicking the... There we go. Um, so I saw this photo four years ago in a Grazia magazine, which is not where I get my news, but I was looking <laughs> for some... I just... It was there. And um, something kind of snapped inside of me, I think probably as a mother. And um, the article that went along with it, just sort of telling about how pathetic their lives are, and I know that we're all used to uh, seeing images of suffering, because it's often in the news, it's in the newspaper. Um, but this one really got me, probably in part because my mother and my grandmother were both born in Bulgaria. And um, also because Bulgaria is very close to where we are. It's actually, you can get there in two hours, two and a half hours. And it's a vacation spot for a lot of people, specifically even people, Brits, maybe some of you guys have been to Bulgaria. Um, and it's an EU country, which makes it that much more shocking. So um, I just thought to myself, well, it's not dangerous. It's not too far away. I'm not going to be putting myself in jeopardy by going there. I see these kids, and I think they need me. You know, they need, they need me. So um, I went. I just went. I flew to Bulgaria, and I worked to try to figure out someone that could take me to the children. Um, and it was not as easy as I hoped it would be because most organizations wanted money. They just said, you know, write a check. And I said, well, I probably could, I could probably raise money, but I need to see for sure what they need before I start asking my friends and my family to help me. Um, so my first visit was about, it was about three and a half years ago, and it was horrific. I've known her some time now, and I didn't really grasp what she'd seen on these trips um, until she shared with me what I'm just about to share with you, um, which is, you know, you'll already have an idea of it from what you've heard this evening, but this is a, an entry into her journal on the occasion of her 
her first visit to Pleven. <clears throat> After weeks of dreading what I would witness at Pleven, I'm actually holding myself together. An hour into my visit, I'm resigned to the fact that this is a horrible, grim, sad place full of pain and plenty of suffering. It is floor after floor, wing after wing, room after room, and cot after cot of very small children and babies. It is almost silent, save for the occasional moan, bang of a head being hit repeatedly against the bars of a cot, or creak of a mattress as a child rocks himself back and forth, back and forth, in an effort to relieve the monotony of nothing. The silence is occasionally shattered by the sporadic, desperate screech of a newborn. The only occupants of Pleven who have not been here long enough to realise that there is no point. I am wet. I am hungry. I am frightened. I want my mother, they shriek. But they will soon learn, within a day or two, that nobody cares. And nobody will come and they too will give up trying. I know it already and I've only been here for an hour. This sea of mostly silent and still children have never had even their both most basic needs met. They lie on dirty cots with soaking nappies and clothes, hungry and for the most part deprived of anything even remotely resembling kindness. They have absolutely no stimulation of any kind. Most of them no longer seem to seek out human touch, but rather flinch, clench, and grind their rotted rows of double teeth, going rigid as I lift their emaciated bodies from their cots and hold them in my arms. One or two of them do, after a few minutes in my arms, relax, sink into my embrace, or actually hold on. My heart is beginning to crack. I'm sweating. I'm breathing only through my mouth to avoid the stench. I'm doing okay. I'm holding it together until I lean down to read the information card on the cot of the child in my arms. I can't tell if the child is a boy or a girl because like all the others, the hair is cut short and the clothes are neutral. This child is tiny, not more than 10 pounds. It's a child. It's terribly small for the two-year-old I imagine it to be. And suddenly I'm anything but okay because according to the tag on her cot, she is almost ten years old. As that fact registers, I'm falling apart. I can't breathe as I process the horror that is this child's existence. And I'm suddenly overcome by the feeling that there is absolutely no hope. <clears throat> None at all. I am unbearably sad, overcome by all the emotions I was fearing all along. I'm clinging to the child and crying. I know there is no hope for any of them. No hope at all. <clears throat> I hear something from the corridor. Voices. Laughter. Chatter. They are buzzing and shuffling and smiling as they enter the room, smiling as they filter in and fan out towards the children. I watch the children relax, react, breathe as they feel the familiar touch, hear the familiar voice of their Baba. The Babas speak their names, reach for them, smile at them, lift them from their cots. They undress them, wash them, redress them one by one, and carry them proudly from the ward. I'm stunned, confused, elated. In this ward, there is a Baba for each child, including the one I'm still clutching. She is patiently watching me, stocky, grey-haired, smiling. She reaches for the child in my arms. I watch her fuss over this wasted, emaciated, contorted little being. 
and finally carry her from the room where this child spends every single other hour of every single day of her unimaginably horrible life. Suddenly something else clicks. Two hours a day, five days a week, is not a lot of time. For many of these children it will not be enough to improve their chances of a normal life, or in some cases even save their lives. It will, however, relieve their agony if only for 10 hours per week. Because for those 10 hours, they will be someone. They will be recognized and touched with kindness and spoken to. And for those 10 hours a week, they will matter. They will matter to their Baba. And the Baba program, which we're supporting tonight, um, we hire local, mature women, so sort of granny types, and they come in and they commit to a year with a child and they spend five days a week, just two hours a day with these children. They come in and they, they just mother them, they granny them, they bath them, they sing to them, they take them outside. Um, they take them out of their cots where they spend the rest of their lives. And these pictures sort of show that, you know, these are these guys, these are, they're in the cots, that's it. That's what they have. They don't come out of there. So Baba's come and they, they do that. Um, Occasionally people ask me why more is not being done to change the system or what, what we can do to change the laws and uh, close the institutions. I totally support all that. I think that is incredibly important, but it's not my strength. And there are a lot of people working toward that and I support it wholeheartedly. I think that's fantastic. But in the meantime, um, these guys are suffering. They're dying today. They're sitting in those cots all day long. It's... I just want to make their today okay, and I want to hopefully keep them alive until the institutions are closed and there is a better um, solution for them. So finally, I saw there's a, there's a little girl, hopefully there she is. This is, this is Veronica. And um, Veronica is actually 10 years old. And this is a photograph of her with her um, adoptive mother. She's been in our program for almost four years. And um, when I met her, she looked like she was going to die, and that's why she was chosen specifically for the program. Um, it, very, just very good luck. Her, it was, her adoptive parents were from America. They were looking for a child. She's got Down syndrome. They got put together with Plevin. Here they are. This woman is taking her home. It's, it's amazing. Um, I think if she hadn't had a Baba, she would probably be dead. She wouldn't be going back to America. So I got an email recently from the adoptive mother who said, um, we can hardly believe we're getting the privilege of adopting her. What a precious, spunky little person she is. And we can hardly wait to bring her home and see what our love can do. The doctors say her condition goes way beyond malnutrition to starvation. Believe me, I have a lot to tell you and a lot to ask you, but most of all, I want to thank you for the pure ball of love, otherwise known as her Baba. That little woman, I am convinced, where is that little woman? Has saved our girl's life. Thank you for the hard work and the time you've put into these children's lives. You're truly making a difference for these little human beings, many of whom have been irreversibly damaged by the system. So for me, that's, that's why we do it. That's what we're doing. We're just, you know, we're just helping one at a time. And, um, and I feel really good about that. So tonight, there's a lot of ways that you can get involved, that you can donate money. We're going to do an auction. We've got the handbags. We've got helping handbags um, for sale and bag charms. And um, I hope that you're inspired to get involved. And I hope that some of you are inspired to maybe go and visit these kids. Because it's really... It's really an amazing um, experience.